Congressman Schiff, we just heard uh, Chuck Schumer say, we all know the depth of the agony that Israel feels. And in that usage of we, he meant Jews. He meant people like himself who have that story in their families of their family members being gunned down and killed the way Jews were killed on October 7th. Well, I think he's absolutely right, Lawrence. Uh, it's hard to find uh, anyone in the Jewish community anywhere in the world uh, who isn't uh, devastated, shocked, horrified, uh, who isn't, I think, on the verge of tears with every story that comes out, every video that we see, uh, every witness account, every family's heartbreak over whether loved ones are still alive or have been lost. Uh, it is it is opening a wound that has never closed. and. We feel it so keenly. At the same time, we feel resolved uh, that we'll do everything we can to help Israel defend itself, uh, help provide the material it needs to defend itself, uh, do everything in our power to protect Israel from the opening of a second front in the north with uh, Iranian-backed Hezbollah. Uh, Israel is enormously vulnerable right now. It would be another uh, terrible blow to Israel if it had to fight a war on two fronts. Uh, and I also want to speak, I think, for the Jewish community, expressing enormous pride uh, with President Biden and how he has handled this and his tremendous empathy for what Israel is going through, for his, his own resolve to wrap his arms around Israel and do what we can to protect Israel, but also his humanity uh, and the efforts he's making to meet the humanitarian needs of people in Gaza uh, and do so in a way that uh, doesn't diminish Israel's capability of defending itself. So a lot of emotions, I think, for all of us in the Jewish community right now. I, I want to get a sense of how uh, shocked you were uh, as a former chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, where on a daily basis you were aware of the kinds of uh, threats in that region that we had intelligence about. Uh, and I'm just wondering, given that history, what, just the, the level of shock you felt when this happened, or whether there was anything in uh, what you'd picked up in the course of your time uh, looking at intelligence that made you somehow less surprised about this than the rest of us? You know, Lawrence, honestly, I think it was quite the opposite. That is, you know, given the close exposure I had to Israeli intelligence and our close working relationship, uh, it made the shock all the more severe that something of this magnitude could happen, uh, that, that we would not have foreknowledge of it, that apparently Israel had no foreknowledge or very little foreknowledge of the magnitude of what was happening. Uh, it was really just incomprehensible, uh, the scope of it, uh, and, and the sheer... Uh, barbarity, barbarity of it, of course, uh, you know, we knew that Hamas uh, were terrorists and this is what they do. They kill, they maim, they kidnap, they rape. They have no respect for human life. Uh, they use their own people as human shields. Um, that we knew, but that they would have the capacity to do something on this order of magnitude uh, without uh, Israel being better prepared uh, was a shock. And, uh, you know, look, I never blame the victim here. Israel's the victim of this heinous Hamas attack. Uh, and we're going to have to uh, work uh, more and more closely with Israel in the days and weeks to come, uh, both to get our hostages uh, back and, and make every effort to, to keep them alive, uh, but also so that we uh, help Israel uh, in the very dangerous undertaking it's about to go through. And I have to say, you know, my heart uh, goes out, too, to all the parents of those re reservists that have been called up for the IDF, those 300,000, uh, all their parents, all their family members uh, who are going to be desperately worried and all the trauma they're going to experience uh, in trying to uh, take out this uh, Hamas threat uh, while uh, doing everything they can to minimize civilian casualties. How important is it uh, that President Biden has a, apparently a pre-wired agreement now uh, with uh, Netanyahu about humanitarian assistance and uh, for the people in Gaza? Well, I, I think it's wonderful, first of all, Lawrence, that the president is going to Israel right now. And I think there there is no overstating the importance of that, not just symbolically, but uh, the degree to which it really 
I think, cements the relationship between our two countries uh, in Israel's most profound hour of need uh, since 1973, since 1948. Uh, this is going to be a, a monumental showing of support. And so I'm, again, so proud that the president is doing this. Uh, but as with all visits, and particularly during a wartime visit, uh, you need to make sure things are locked down. You don't want uh, in any way to either, A, interrupt the Israeli uh, effort to defend itself. You don't want the timetable to be adjusted by a visit. Uh, it, there are more, uh, there are greater urgencies. But also, you don't want any kind of uh, discord between these two leaders. Uh, so it's important to nail all this down in advance. And I, and I think they have. Roger, we always begin with anyone who was uh, who, who heard everything that happened in the in the courtroom today. Uh, what was it like? I've, we've read the transcript, uh, but it seems like uh, the judge certainly at the end uh, took full control of this. Yeah, it was uh, it was very exciting. Everyone uh, in the media in the media room, you know, had a sense that this is an unprecedented. Uh, issue. Uh, it's an incredibly sensitive First Amendment issue, and uh, there's really nothing. There isn't a whole lot of law on this generally. You'd, it's a little surprising. You would think it would come up more often, but where a party, as opposed to a, particularly an attorney, uh, is creating this sort of issue, um, it's incredibly sensitive, and uh, uh, it was it, it was an exciting uh, it was an exciting hearing. Uh, Neil Katyal, uh, Donald Trump said today that he's going to appeal. <laughs> Good luck with that one. Um, that's going nowhere. And Roger's right that there's not a huge amount of case law. But the reason that there's not a huge amount of case law is because, Lawrence, no criminal defendant in their right mind would act the way Donald Trump is. I mean, the crazy part of this situation is not that a judge issued a gag order against a leading presidential candidate. The crazy part is that a leading presidential candidate has made a habit of threatening and attacking witnesses and prosecutors and court officials. That's the story. And Donald Trump is incapable of doing anything else. That's why I think it's like a coin flip, whether Trump's going to violate this gag order first or whether the House is going to elect a new speaker first. And so to me, like what happened today is, if anything, Trump getting special treatment. I mean, you know, you can try and appeal this, but the fact is no other criminal defendant, Judge Chutkin's absolutely right, would even get away with what she's allowing him to get away with here. And the gag order just simply tells Trump to behave like he has a modicum of decency, which is probably why it'll be so hard for him to follow it. Yeah, Andrew, my reading of the transcript, uh, the judge seemed to indicate that no other defendant ever would have gotten this far. It, it would never have come to this. So there is this element of some special treatment here. I think that's right. I agree with you. I agree with Neil on that. I would point out that the two cases that I can think of where this has happened, where there have been so-called gag orders with respect to not the lawyers, but the defendants, are Paul Manafort and Roger Stone. Um, all defendants related to, closely, to Donald Trump. And to tie it to this past horrendous week of violence, you have the former president of the United States now being subjected to two court orders uh, in connection with a civil matter and a criminal matter where the courts have said, and I'm quoting from Judge Chutkin, that his language implicitly encourages violence against public servants who are simply doing their job. Uh, this is the former president implicitly encouraging violence. And this is at a time that we are seeing what can happen when people resort to violence instead of the rule of law. Um, so I think it's an important thing that the judge did here. I think it's an important thing that the state judge did in the civil case. Um, and it remains to be seen whether it, he, he adheres to both of these gag orders. And Roger Parloff, the judge uh, let the uh, Trump defense lawyer go off in a direction that she ultimately labeled campaign rhetoric. Uh, yes. Uh, 
she she did she tried to she commented that he was obviously speaking for an, an audience of uh, of one at times and uh, she tried to rein him back in but um the thing she said twice uh that struck me was she mentioned this uh famous line of will no one rid me of this meddlesome priest you know the line from henry uh, the second uh, before uh, the murder of uh, thomas beckett um, and uh, obviously, she thinks these tweets are not just rude or impolite. They are, he, and he understands that they are pushing his more unstable supporters to go out and harass and intimidate and threaten and possibly harm witnesses. And there is a record that he's done this in the past, and that's been the effect. And uh, I thought she was very... Uh, you know, adamant that this has to stop. Ben, it seems likely uh, that Israel will not launch a land invasion, a ground invasion of Gaza before President Biden leaves Israel. Yes, uh, Lawrence, I, I can't imagine uh, that Israel would do that, uh, both because of the potential risk of escalation while President Biden is there, and also just because uh, I think the purpose of this visit is to have a consultation, a full, robust, comprehensive uh, consultation between President Biden and the Israeli government before they launch that invasion. Um, so I think that this indicates that the timeline for that uh, ground invasion is likely moving a bit to the right here. The, in the less than three minutes uh, that Secretary Blinken laid out the agenda for uh, President Biden when he comes to Israel, he easily described the single most important meeting by a president of, of the United States in Israel that has ever occurred? Yeah, not even close, Lawrence. I mean, this is uh, absolutely unprecedented. Uh, obviously, what's happened in Israel is unprecedented. Um, the risk of regional escalation is unprecedented. And the idea of a president flying into that kind of circumstance, where there's literal danger in terms of the rockets that are continuing to come at, at Tel Aviv, but also all manner of risks about not knowing where exactly this is going. But what's clear is that Secretary Blinken was on that trip he went to every major partner, Arab partner in the region after consulting previously with Israel. And clearly what he determined is there are a number of issues where it's absolutely essential that the U.S. and Israel are on the same page. Uh, how do we prevent regional escalation? What is the messaging that has to be done to Iran and proxies like Hezbollah to prevent escalation? Uh, how can we ensure a sufficient humanitarian component to any Israeli operation in Gaza that doesn't set the region on fire? And I'm sure that that's the message that Secretary Blinken was getting from those Arab partners, um, that, that, that we have to take every step possible to both uh, have a, an Israeli military operation that abides by laws of war, but that also mitigates the harm to Palestinian civilians. And so clearly, Secretary Blinken took all of those messages from Arab leaders back to Israel, um, compared notes uh, and saw whether or not the time was right for President Biden to, to step in like this. And the fact that he was meeting for seven hours with Prime Minister Netanyahu indicates this is real substance, right? This wasn't just kind of window dressing uh, the secretary meeting with the foreign leader to tee up the president's visit. They were literally negotiating the agenda, the deliverables, the announcements that are going to come out of that visit from President Biden as well. Yeah, and the Washington Post is reporting uh, U.S. officials waited to announce uh, President Biden's travel to Israel until they received commitments from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on a humanitarian package Monday night, according to two U.S. officials familiar with the discussions. Uh, and, and Ben, that's, that's all about that seven-hour meeting that Secretary Blinken was in. No, that's right. And you heard even in his remarks, uh, Tony's remarks, I think, clearly indicated what the, the back and forth and the points of tension are on this. On the one hand, uh, there is an overwhelming imperative to address the humanitarian crisis in Gaza that is growing more acute. And that, again, surely was the concern that, that Tony Blinken heard from all the different Arab leaders and that we're seeing, obviously, around the, uh, around the world. On the other hand, you heard in his messaging what the Israelis are concerned about, 
which is if we provide a humanitarian corridor into Gaza, if we start shipping aid into Gaza, if we create safe zones in Gaza, that Hamas will manipulate that, that they'll disrupt the aid, that they'll try to get their hands on things that might be used for a military purpose as well. And so I think you heard, even those, those brief remarks from Tony Blinken, uh, we, we, we heard exactly what was discussed in that meeting with Prime Minister Nanya, which was the U.S. wanting to make sure that there was a commitment to a humanitarian effort to alleviate the situation in Gaza, but Israel wanting to hear from the United States that we understand uh, that there's a risk that Hamas could try to take advantage of that. And that clearly was... Uh, part, a big part of the discussion in that meeting that, that Tony Blinken had in Israel. There, there's a lesson, I'd say, in the last 24 hours for people watching uh, this coverage uh, across television. Where, With the president last night on 60 Minutes, he was asked, uh, pressed about humanitarian aid in Gaza, and he was minimally forthcoming. He certainly said that it's necessary, we have to figure out something, the team is working on something. Uh, and, of course, much more was going on than uh, what was indicated in his answers 24 hours ago. Uh, 24 hours later, you see a hint of how much more. And, of course, that means whatever we know tonight, there is even more going on underneath that. That's exactly right, Lawrence. I've been in situations like this. Uh, this one is uh, perhaps more acute. But what's been going on is constant communication between the Secretary of Defense and the Pentagon and the IDF, uh, between, I'm sure, the NSC and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and his counterparts, Tony Blinken doing the shuttle diplomacy around the region, uh, and really the position that the United States has put itself in, that, that President Biden has put himself in, is that he saw the trauma that this attack imposed on Israel, the horrific nature of it, and their imperative to respond. He wrapped his arms around Israel, you know, quite literally, uh, with his initial messaging. But then, obviously, they're also looking at this and seeing, well, there's risk here. There's risk if this military operation goes forward in haste, um, that they could prompt a regional escalation, as we've talked about. Hezbollah coming in, the West Bank exploding, Arab public opinion exploding. Uh, there's risk obviously, to the civilians in Gaza. Clearly, what the United States has been trying to do is say to Israel, let's take a, a, a just a moment here and think through how can we manage this operation that we know you're going to undertake in ways that mitigate that risk, that are more likely to prevent regional escalation. We, the United States, will show you our commitment to your security, not just through our messaging, but by two aircraft carrier groups that are being sent to this region to send a message to Iran to stay out of this. Um, at the same time, though, we need to see something from Israel that indicates that they understand that the world is watching the humanitarian crisis in Gaza as well. It's incredibly complicated, but clearly the administration wants that messaging done in private when it comes to the nature of the humanitarian crisis and how you alleviate that. The only tip of the hand from President Biden was the sense that he doesn't want to see a full reoccupation of Gaza. But underneath that, uh, in order for this visit to happen, because it's incredibly consequential and risky step, Lawrence, uh, they're leaning into this thing. Uh, the risk is that you kind of have ownership over whatever happens next. But the reward is you can impact events and you can prevent that regional escalation and you might be able to alleviate the humanitarian crisis. And clearly, Joe Biden has determined it's better to lean in and try to have an impact here uh, and take some risk about where this thing might go than to step back. With President Biden, he always seems to have his eye on the risk, uh, on, on, of course, the possible reward, but then also, and perhaps more than others have in the past in his role, on what he sees as his duty. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's both something he feels intuitively. I mean, I don't know how many times in, I was in the room with President Biden uh, when he would tell the story about going there in the 70s for the first time and meeting with Prime Minister Golda Meir of Israel and her telling him that, you know, the reason uh, that you know we're going to be here is that we have nowhere else to go. Um, and it's something that he feels intuitively. But the other thing that I think is really important, Lawrence, is that psychologically, I think he understands that Israelis feel vulnerable right now. Mm -hmm. They feel isolated. It is always the case. There is no, there are few places on earth where people are more appreciative of visits, of people setting feet on the ground uh, than Israel. I can't even imagine what the impact of this visit will be on the psychology of Israel, uh, given how vulnerable people are feeling right now. Um, they're seeing the United States government literally chartering planes to get Americans out. Uh, and yet there is the president of the United States flying in. Um, that is an incredibly powerful thing, Lawrence. I don't think we even can can grasp how much this will mean. Um, but there's a lot uh, to, to be done. This is a substantive meeting as well. 
Um, and, and, and so, uh, you know, the meeting between Pr Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Biden, two people who have not agreed on everything and come from different ends of the political spectrum, um, is going to be an incredibly consequential meeting in terms of the substance in addition to the symbolism of this visit.